So in today's module, we're going to take a look at Lewis structures. Uh, so basically taking a look at how we can think about Lewis structures and determining the covalent bonds that form, the electrons that are involved in those bonds um, with respect to the octet rule that nonmetals and metals both react in a way to obtain eight electrons in their outer shell. First, a few announcements as always. So module eight homework is due on Sunday, November 8th. I moved all the homeworks to the weekend just to make everything easier. Um, I'm also gonna make a separate uh, module about bond polarity posted on Blackboard. I finished all of my grading uh, Friday and Saturday night. I'm still waiting on a few of the TAs to finish their grading, but I hope to have the exam averages out soon. So far, the results look pretty good. The one section that I finished uh, I think the class average is between 74, right in that range. Um, also, we are entering the home stretch of the semester, right? The final three weeks of the semester here. So this is really crunch time. We've got to find the energy. We've got to find the determination to make it through the semester, to see it to exam four so that we can close the book on Chem 106 and get that well-deserved and well-needed um, rest and recovery uh, over Thanksgiving and an extended winter break this semester. So if you find yourself struggling, if you find yourself behind on anything, anything, homework, um, recitation material, please reach out to me, reach out to one of the TAs. Please let us know because now the time is essential. Now, right, we are counting down the final days in, in exactly that, in terms of days and hours. So uh, we really are running out of time with the semester. So if you are behind uh, and you want to make a, a change to your semester and your grade, please let us know. Uh, because if you reach out the day or the last day of the semester, by then it's too late. But if you let us know now, right now, we can still try to do something in the three weeks that are left. So let's just try to get to the finish as best we can. We just need to keep moving forward, even if we, we don't want to it sometimes. We need to just keep moving forward um, until we get to the end of the semester. So in our previous lecture, we looked at ionic bonds and looking at, for example, like the formation of magnesium fluoride in terms of the Lewis dot diagram of magnesium losing two valence electrons and the fluorines each gaining one valence electron. Uh, and then we got into briefly looking at covalent electrons, uh, covalent bond formation. So today at the focus of this lecture, we'll be looking at those covalent bonds where we're sharing electrons. And right, so last class we looked at a covalent compound. We looked at HCl, for example, and we looked at the Lewis dot formula for HCl. And we had hydrogen and I represented hydrogen with its one electron. And in HCl, right, we've got chlorine. We looked at chlorine and chlorine came with its seven electrons, hydrogen with one electron, but together they share, right? They share each one electron to fill the outer shell of both. So hydrogen ends up being isoelectronic with helium, having two electrons. Chlorine also ends up with that full octet, the full outer shell, once it shares that one electron from hydrogen. And within this, this Lewis dot diagram, we have, right, we've got bonding electrons that are shared between elements in a covalent bond. And we have lone pair or non-bonding electrons that are not shared. Between atoms. Right, so our shared electrons, our shared electrons are these two electrons that are shared between HCl. So when I draw HCl like this, right, I'm representing two electrons right there. Those are my shared, my bonding electrons. The lone pair electrons, these are the ones that are assigned to and only belong to chlorine. They are not shared um, within that structure. 
So let's take a look at how I would generate, right? For HCl, it's pretty easy because hydrogen has one electron, chlorine has seven, so they come together, right? They're each gonna share one electron to fill the outer shell of the other element. Let's take a look at making something a little bit more complex, the Lewis dot diagram for phosphorus trichloride, for example. So let's see how we would put together the Lewis formula for this compound. Step number one in writing a Lewis dot formula, we need to to determine the total number of valence electrons. So if we were to go to the periodic table of the elements, we need to look up, we've got phosphorus and I have three chlorines. Electron configuration of phosphorus is neon, 3s2, 3p3. Right, the outermost electrons are my valence electrons, so phosphorus has five valence electrons. Electron configuration of chlorine is neon, 3s2, 3p5. So I've got seven valence electrons. I have three chlorines, so seven times three. Right, I've got 21 electrons total from chlorine. So 21 plus the five electrons from phosphorus, a total of 26 valence electrons I need to account for in this molecule, in the phosphorus trichloride. If we have a negative charge associated with the molecule, we need to add an electron. And if we have a positive charge, we need to subtract an electron from that total for each of the charges. So if we had a minus three, for example, we would add three electrons to this total. So one electron for each of those negative charges. Step two, we wanna put the least electronegative element in the center. So we're gonna place the least electronegative element in the center. And we're going to surround it with the remaining elements. And then we're going to connect the central atom to the surrounding elements. All right, so I'm gonna place phosphorus in the center and then I'm gonna connect phosphorus to the chlorines using a covalent bond. And a covalent bond contains two electrons, right? So one, two, three, four, five, and six. So I had 26 total electrons that I had to assign, and I just assigned six of those electrons as bonding electrons between the phosphorus and the chlorine. So I have 20 electrons remaining that I have to assign. And right here I've drawn the covalent bond as the two dots, but it would be the same if I drew phosphorus in the center and drew chlorine like that, where I used, right, this single bond to represent those two valence electrons. So both of these mean the same thing. Step one, determine the total number of valence electrons. Step two, assign the least electronegative element to the center and surround it with the other elements, the remaining elements. And just to confirm, right, that phosphorus is less electronegative, remember electronegativity increases from the lower left to the upper right-hand corner. And so the farther to the left we get, the less electronegative that element will be. So when we're comparing phosphorus to chlorine, right, phosphorus is farther to the left, it is less electronegative than chlorine. So we made the right choice by putting phosphorus in the middle. All right, step one and step two done. Now when you do step three, we wanna fill the octet of each of the surrounding elements
using the remaining valence electrons. Right, so we counted a total of 26 valence electrons. I added six electrons, or I, I used six electrons that were bonding, and that left me with 20 electrons left. So now I want to fill the octet of the surrounding atom. So the octet rule, right, each atom wants to have a total of eight electrons in its outer shell. So right now, chlorine has two in the bond. So I'm going to add in six more. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. So I just added 18 more electrons as lone pair electrons, right? I have two electrons remaining now. So I filled the octet for chlorine though, so chlorine so far is pretty good in this Lewis dot formula, right? Chlorine is satisfied because it has eight electrons in its outer shell. I have two electrons here that are bonding electrons, and then I have six non-bonding electrons assigned to each chlorine. So the last rule, the last step that we wanna use is basically any electrons we have left, right? We're gonna to assign to the central element. So if we look, Right now, I haven't completed the octet rule with respect to phosphorus. Right now, phosphorus only has six electrons assigned to it in the form of these three single bonds. And I know I have two electrons remaining, so step four, assign any remaining electrons to the central atom. in the Lewis dot formula. Right, so we added up a total of 26 valence electrons. I assigned six electrons as bonding. I assigned 18 electrons as non-bonding. And that left me with two electrons, so I've got two electrons to assign and I'm gonna assign them to phosphorus, and those are lone pair electrons on the phosphorus, right? The previous 18, those were assigned to the chlorine. Now, if we take a look at the phosphorus, now phosphorus also has eight electrons, right? I've got two electrons here, I've got two electrons here, I've got two electrons here, and then the two lone pair electrons. So I've got eight total electrons assigned to phosphorus. I've used all the electrons I have to assign, right? I just assigned two more as a lone pair, so zero electrons remain. I filled the octet for chlorine and phosphorus, so this is a valid Lewis dot structure for phosphorus trichloride. So here's one for you to try. Let's try drawing the Lewis dot formula for the following compound, sulfur dichloride. All right, and I'll even give you the configuration for both sulfur and for chlorine. We've got two chlorines, remember? So sulfur is neon 3s2 3p4 for six valence electrons, and chlorine is still neon 3s2 3p5 for seven valence electrons. I have two chlorines, total of 14 electrons from the chlorine, six electrons from sulfur, 20 electrons total that I have to assign. So what is a valid Lewis structure for sulfur dichloride? All right, so our first step, we're going to put sulfur in the middle. We're going to flank it with chlorine on both sides. So I just used two electrons in each of those bonds. So I have my 20 electrons total. I just used four of those electrons as bonding electrons. So that's 16 left. Well, the next step is I want to fill the octet of chlorine. So I'm going to assign six electrons here. 
To chlorine, I'm going to assign six more electrons here to this chlorine for a total of 12 more electrons that have been used as uh, non-bonding, lone pair. All right, that's 16. That means I've got four electrons left. Well, I still haven't completed the... Uh, outer shell, the, the outer shell of sulfur. Right now, sulfur just has four electrons assigned to it, so those last two electrons, right, would go to sulfur. One, two, three, four. Now, sulfur has eight electrons in its octet, and so do both chlorines, and I've assigned all the electrons um, that I have, all the non, all of the valence electrons that I have to work with. Right, so just differentiating the non-bonding electrons from chlorine and the non-bonding electrons from sulfur. And just to draw this as a Lewis dot diagram, just to make sure we're all on the same page, right? Let's just put sulfur in the middle, right? Sulfur brings six electrons um, to the Lewis structure. Chlorine is gonna bring seven electrons Right, and so if we wanted to draw those bonds, instead of drawing it as a straight line, drawing them as the electrons that are represented there, right here would be our valence, our Lewis dot diagram for sulfur dichloride. Where each of those elements has a full outer shell of eight electrons, eight electrons assigned to chlorine, sulfur, and the other chlorine. Here's one more for you, carbon tetrachloride. What would be the appropriate uh, Lewis dot formula for carbon tetrachloride? And first things first, right, we're gonna need to know the configuration of carbon, right? Carbon is helium uh, 2s2, 2p2 for four valence electrons from carbon. And we have four chlorines and chlorine still hasn't changed since the first time we've used it. Uh, 3s2, 3p5, seven valence electrons. From each chlorine, I have four chlorines, so four times seven, I've got 28 electrons from chlorine. My four electrons from carbon, I've got 32 electrons to assign in carbon tetrachloride. So first things first, I'm assigning my carbon as the least electronegative, that's gonna go in the center flanked by my four chlorines, one, two, three, and four. I had 32 electrons. I just assigned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I just assigned eight electrons as bonding electrons. And now I wanna fill the octet of chlorine, so I'm gonna fill the octet of those chlorines. I'm gonna assign six more electrons to each chlorine to fill the octet of all of these chlorines. So there's six, there's 12, there's 18, and there's 24 right here. So I used eight as bonding electrons, 24 electrons were non-bonding, and 32 minus eight minus 24, zero electrons remain. So I've been able to assign all of these uh, valence electrons within the first two steps. And if I take a look at carbon, carbon already has eight electrons assigned to it, two electrons from each of those carbon chlorine single bonds. So yes, the outer shell, the octet of carbon is complete as well. All right, so here's a hard one. This one's a little bit harder for you. So we've got phosgene. Um, so what would be the a valid Lewis dot formula for phosgene? And we're gonna start the same place we've done for all of these. I'm gonna give you the electron configuration of all of the elements. So I've got carbon, oxygen, and then I've got two chlorines at play. Carbon is helium, oxygen is also helium, and chlorine is neon. 3s2, 3p5. Oxygen is 2s2, 2p4 and carbon is helium 2s2, 2p2. Four electrons from carbon, I've got six electrons from oxygen, 
two chlorines, seven electrons each, 14 electrons there for a total of 24 valence electrons. I'm going to place my carbon in the center. My carbon is the least electronegative. And I'm going to flank it with the oxygen and the chlorines. Next, I'm going to connect all of them with at least one covalent bond, right? So one, two, and three. So I had 24 electrons. I just assigned six electrons. I've got 18 more electrons to assign. So now I'm going to fill the octet for the surrounding atoms, right? So each atom already has two. They need six more. So there's six. There's 12. And now there's 18. So I've assigned all 18 of those electrons, and now I'm done, right? Is this a valid Lewis structure for phosgene, or is there something wrong with this Lewis structure? Right, there is something wrong with this Lewis structure, and that's the fact that this carbon does not have a full octet. That carbon only has six electrons assigned to it, and so to remedy that, what we can do is we can share electrons. We can take some electrons and share them from an oxygen in the form of a carbon-oxygen double bond. And so the valid Lewis structure, the actual valid Lewis structure for phosgene, I've got a carbon-oxygen double bond and a carbon-chlorine, two separate carbon-chlorine single bonds. Fill the octet. I put four more electrons on oxygen, because I've got four within the double bond, four more as lone pair on oxygen. I've got two within the single bond, and I'm going to assign six as the lone pair to chlorine. I'm still going to assign 24 electrons, but now I have a valid Lewis structure for phosgene, because now oxygen has a full octet, both chlorines have a full octet, and the carbon, the central carbon, also has a full octet. So this is a valid Lewis structure for phosgene. Within Lewis structures, we may have Lewis structures for the same compound, but are different. And they're different in their localization, their, their location of the assigned electrons. And those are resonance structures, where we have delocalized bonding. We have the ability of electrons to move through these resonance structures. And if we take a look at the structure for ozone on the left and the structure of ozone on the right, the only difference is where those electrons are assigned. And so, for example, if I take these two electrons right here that are assigned to oxygen and move them in and form a and oxygen, oxygen double bond right here. And as that happens, as that bond is forming, it pushes out these electrons right here and assigns them to this oxygen. And that would give us this structure right here with these two electrons being the lone pair electrons that were just pushed out of the oxygen, oxygen single bond. So I could return to my original structure and to return to my original structure, I just push these electrons back in forming that, reforming that oxygen-oxygen double bond and push these electrons back out to that oxygen. That is delocalized bonding, the ability to move electrons through a structure. And so instead of thinking of these electrons as located in one space, really we can think of these electrons, these two electrons, right, are shared over three oxygens. The two oxygens on both sides and then the oxygen that's in the center. And we see that as well. Um, if we were going to look at the structure of ozone and measure the bond distances 
within ozone. If ozone was just one of these structures, if only one structure of ozone existed, I would go and measure those bond lengths, and a double bond is always shorter than a single bond because you've got more orbital overlap. Um, so if you were to go and measure ozone and it had a double bond and a single bond, you would measure two different bond lengths. That's not the case, however. However, when we go and measure the bond lengths of ozone, both of those oxygen bonds are identical length, which means both of those oxygen bonds are identical. I don't have a double bond and a single bond. I have a hybrid. In both cases, I have a hybrid of both because both are currently possible, right? Those electrons are constantly moving from one end of the molecule to the other. And those are my resonance formulas. The resonance formulas are, are simply that the representation of each possible Lewis structure for a molecule. And so I don't have, you know, a structure on the left. I don't have the structure on the right. A better way of thinking about this is I have oxygen, oxygen. Those electrons don't move. That positive charge stays there. Four electrons on each of the oxygens stay. The only two electrons that move are these um, two lone pair electrons. And so I can think of it as basically I have at all times, I have partial double bond and partial single bond character. That's why I drew that um, as a dotted line, is that sometimes I have a double bond there, and sometimes double bond is over here. It's bouncing back and forth, so I can spread out that double bond across the entire molecule. And you'll also notice that in one Lewis structure, I have a negative charge here. The other Lewis structure, the negative charge assigned to the other oxygen. So I've spread that negative charge out. I've spread that electron density out. Resonance is incredibly important uh, into understanding the stability of some molecules because it helps us move charge. Right? We don't want to carry charge all the time. So being able to move it and disperse that charge makes it a more stable structure. So here's a question for you. What are all possible resonance structures for the carbonate anion? How many possible resonance structures do we have for a carbonate anion? And I'll give you carbon and oxygen, right? Carbon is helium, 2s2, 2p2. Oxygen, and I have three oxygens, is helium, 2s2, 2p4. So I've got four electrons from carbon, and I've got six times three. I've got 18 electrons from oxygen. So that's 22 electrons. And remember our first rule, if we have a charge, we add one electron for each negative charge. Um, that we have. So I'd have to add two more electrons for a total of 24 electrons I'd have to assign. So how many possible resonance structures are there of carbonate? Well, let's take a look. The first resonance structure of carbonate would look something like this. I have 24 electrons to assign. I just assigned 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 as bonding electrons. So that leaves me with 16 electrons. Now I'm going to fill the octet of all the surrounding oxygens, right? So I've got two. Well, there's six more that fills that oxygen. This oxygen has two. Here's six more, so that's 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So I've assigned all of the oxygens, all the oxygens have a full octet. I've assigned all the lone pair electrons. Carbon also has a full octet, so I've assigned all the electrons I have. This is one valid resonance structure for carbonate. 
The other two structures, all I'm going to do is I'm going to move this electron density through. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two electrons and form a double bond here. And as that double bond forms, I'm going to push the two electrons out onto this oxygen. So my next Lewis structure is going to look something like this. where now the double bond has shifted. The double bond is now shifted, and it's between the carbon and oxygen on the right. Okay, there's resonance structure one, resonance structure two, and now as we can see, there's only one more place where I could move these electrons, where I haven't already had these electrons. There's only one more place where I could put this double bond, and so I'm gonna take two electrons from this oxygen now, right? This oxygen hasn't had a carbon-oxygen double bond. I'm gonna take those two electrons, put those into a carbon-oxygen double bond as that bond's forming, pushing these two electrons out. And so that would be the third and final possible resonance structure for this compound. So in all of these resonance structures, right, that oxygen carbon double bond has been at all three possible locations. All three of these resonance structures, I'm not violating the rules in any sense of the way because all atoms have a full octet, the correct number of electrons assigned. I've assigned all the electrons that I have to work with, all the valence electrons are assigned, um, either in bonding or non-bonding right, lone pair. So I have three possible resonance structures. All right, the key here in resonance structures, the only thing that moves in resonance structures are electrons. I'm not moving atoms, I'm not moving connections. Um, I'm not changing what's bonded to what, I'm just moving electrons within that molecule. And in some cases, it'll be possible to draw more than one Lewis structure. So when that happens, how do I determine, how do I figure out what is the correct Lewis structure, if I can draw multiple Lewis structures? And to help us do that, we use formal charge. Formal charge is helping us, going to help us figure out, um, in the case of multiple Lewis structures, which one is the correct or best representation of that molecule. Formal charge is a way to help us determine whether we have the correct Lewis structure, or if there are multiple Lewis structures available, the best Lewis structure. All that formal charge is, it's determined by subtracting the assigned number of electrons from the group number. Of the atom. So what does this look like, right? Let's just write this out. We've got the group number up here. Hydrogen group one, carbon is group four, nitrogen is group five, one, five, and four. Assigned electrons. So for the assigned electron, you're going to count one electron for each bond. And you're going to count both electrons if they're lone pair electrons. So if we take a look at hydrogen, for example, hydrogen's got one electron in this carbon-hydrogen bond, so there's one electron assigned to that. If we take a look at carbon, carbon is in a carbon-hydrogen bond for one electron, and then three carbon-nitrogen bonds for a total of four electrons assigned to carbon. Taking a look at nitrogen, nitrogen is in three carbon 
nitrogen bonds. One electron each plus two lone pair electrons for a total of five electrons assigned to nitrogen. So to find the formal charge, we subtract group number, we subtract um, the number of assigned electrons from group number. So one minus one is zero, four minus four is zero, and five minus five is zero. Taking a look at the other Lewis structure that I've drawn to the right, I still have one electron assigned to this hydrogen, so that's good. However, now that I have nitrogen in the center, nitrogen has four single bonds, right, for four electrons total. So five minus four is plus one. So there should be a plus one charge, formal charge assigned to that nitrogen. And then now looking at carbon, three single bonds is three electrons, two lone pairs, five total electrons there. I've assigned a charge of minus one. So two different Lewis structures. They're both valid in the sense that I've got the correct number of electrons assigned, but they're not ideal in the sense that one, in one, I'm carrying a greater amount of charge than I am in the other. So the most likely Lewis structure is the structure that carries the least amount of charge, right, has the fewest number of atoms carrying charge. And if and it's possible, it's possible we're going to have to assign charge, right? Things like carbonate or 2 minus, right? We've looked at things that have charge assigned to them. So if charge needs to be assigned, right? Negative charge should be assigned. to the most electronegative element. And if positive charge needs to be assigned, needs to be assigned, it needs to be on the least electronegative element. So right with that being said, the best Lewis structure is the Lewis structure where I have uh, zero charge assigned, right? I've got all the electrons assigned, but there's a zero charge assigned to carbon hydrogen, and nitrogen. Whereas in the structure on the right, I've got a plus one and a negative one. And on top of that, the negative charge should be on the most electronegative element. Nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So if I had to assign a negative charge, it would rather be on nitrogen than on carbon. We're going to see a few exceptions to the octet rule. So we're going to look at ions, molecules, that have an odd number of electrons. We're also going to look at ions, um, molecules that have less than eight valence electrons. Right, less than an octet. And we're also going to look at ions and molecules that have more than valence electrons. Right, so they end up having more than an octet.
Number one is a radical, right? So free radicals, if you've heard of, if you've seen the commercial for the pomegranate juice and they call themselves the free radical annihilator, um, a radical is a compound that has an unpaired electron, has an odd number of electrons. So for here, an example, there's one electron right there. Here's one electron right there. That's an unpaired electron, and that is a radical. Very high energy. Very reactive, right? And that's why we want to uh, get rid of radicals. Um, and so, for example, this, this pomegranate juice, right, it's a radical annihilator, and what it does is Radicals, because they're so reactive, what they want to do is they want to have a full pair of electrons. And they do that by stealing an electron from the first thing they react with. And so what that does is if they react with something within your cells or within your body, right, they're damaging that material by, stake, by taking electrons from it. And so instead of reacting with something in your body, they could react with something in your diet, like a vitamin C, for example, um, anything that's an antioxidant, what they're really good at at is reacting with these radicals because they're very high energy and very reactive compound because they have an unpaired electron. The second violation that we're going to see or the second odd thing that we're going to see is something that has fewer than eight electrons in its octet. And so look at the three Lewis structures shown here for boron trifluoride. In all three of these Lewis structures, we've assigned the correct number of electrons that we have to work with. Right, I've filled the octet for boron, I've filled the octet for fluorine, and yet I've also broken some of the rules that we know about, right? So I've, I've assigned charge. I wanna have the lowest charge possible. And if I look at where I've assigned that charge, if I take a look, right, I have a, a negative charge assigned to boron and a positive charge assigned to fluorine. I know that if I want to assign charge, I want the positive charge on the least electronegative element. And I want the negative charge on the most electronegative element. Fluorine is the most electronegative. So the negative charge should be there. The positive charge should be on boron if I have to assign a charge. So maybe there's something wrong with this Lewis structure. Even though I've filled the octet for boron and fluorine, I've assigned charges where charges don't want to be. And the lesson is, in the case of boron and hydrogen, for example, right? we've already seen a Lewis structure that used hydrogen, um, that there are some elements that'll never have more than eight electrons in its outer shell, right? Some elements... will never have a full octet, right? Boron being an example, hydrogen, hydrogen being another example. So boron will never have more than six valence electrons in its outer shell. Hydrogen will never have more than two. Right, so here is a better representation of boron trifluoride. I've filled the octet of all three fluorines. I've assigned all the electrons that I have to assign. And even better, right, I don't have any charges. Yes, I only have six electrons assigned to boron, but that's fine. Boron is fine with six electrons in its outer shell because boron violates the octet rule. And for the last exception to the octet rule that we're going to see, it takes place in the third row. So if we look at any element beyond phosphorus, phosphorus and beyond, so any element in the third row when we're dealing with our nonmetals, so I could expect to see it with phosphorus and sulfur, chlorine, argon, selenium, bromine, iodine. Um, those elements can have more than eight electrons assigned. So what is unique about elements in the third row? What do elements in the third row have access to for the first time? 
in the third row, elements have access to empty d orbitals. Right in the third quantum level, I have s, p, and d orbitals. So the reason why I can hold more than eight electrons in elements of phosphorus and beyond is because those elements have access to d orbitals, the three d orbitals. So I can place more than eight electrons in those elements. So to demonstrate that, let's write the valid Lewis structure for phosphorus pentachloride. All right, so let's draw out the electron configuration first for phosphorus and chlorine. chlorine. So I've got one phosphorus, I've got five chlorine. Phosphorus is neon 3s2, 3p3. And I've got five chlorines. Chlorine is neon 3s2, 3p5. So seven electrons from chlorine, five chlorines each, right? 35 electrons from all of my chlorines to go with the five electrons from phosphorus. I have 40 electrons to assign. Rule number one, I'm going to, after I determine all the number of valence electrons, rule number two, I'm going to place the least electronegative element in the center. So that would be my phosphorus. I'm going to flank it with chlorine. So one, right? Two, three, four, and five. So chlorine, 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 and chlorine. Five single bonds, two electrons each. I just assigned 10 bonding electrons. I've got 30 electrons remaining. I'm going to assign those 30 electrons by filling out the octet of all the chlorines. All right, each of the chlorines has two electrons. I'm going to add six more. So there's six, all right? Here's 12. Here's 18 electrons. Here's 24 electrons that I've assigned. And here are the last six, right? There are the 30 electrons that I've assigned. And they're non-bonding on the chlorine. I've assigned all of the 40 electrons I have to assign. I've filled the octet of chlorine. So all the chlorines have a full octet. And then to make this Lewis structure, I had to violate the octet rule with respect to phosphorus, right? Phosphorus has two electrons, two electrons, two electrons, two more, and then the last two. So phosphorus, right, has 10 electrons associated with it. That's a violation of the octet rule, but that's fine because phosphorus is down here in the third row and has access to d orbitals. Here's one more to try, xenon tetrafluoride. Xenon, it is a noble gas, but it happens to be the one noble gas that is reactive. It's krypton 5s2, 4d10, uh, 5p6. We only tend to think of the S and P electrons as my valence electrons. So xenon has eight valence electrons. I've got four fluorines. Fluorine is helium, 2S2, 2P5. So seven electrons from the fluorine, four fluorines total for 28 electrons from the fluorine, 36 electrons total to assign. Least electronegative element in the center, that's got to be xenon because fluorine is the most electronegative. So xenon, fluorine, 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 right? I just assigned eight electrons as bonding electrons to the fluorine. So 36 minus eight electrons. I have uh, 24, sorry, I have 28 electrons remaining. All right, now let's fill the octet of fluorine, right? So fluorine has two already. I'm going to give fluorine six more electrons for a total of eight. So there's six. Here's six more for 12. Here is six more for 18. And here is six more for 24 electrons. Four electrons remaining. The last rule is to assign those electrons uh, to the central atom, right? So I've got two electrons, 
right here and two electrons right here for a total of four electrons. That's zero electrons remaining. I've assigned all 36 electrons. In doing so, I've violated the octet rule for xenon. That's fine, right? I've assigned eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 electrons to xenon, but that's fine because xenon, right, is beyond the third row. Xenon has access to d orbitals. We can also represent that by looking at the Lewis structures of these phosphate anions, right? Phosphate is PO4 three minus. I could look at both of these Lewis structures. Both of these Lewis structures are valid Lewis structures. The one on the left, I have not violated the octet rule for phosphorus. I've got eight electrons assigned to phosphorus, eight electrons assigned to all the oxygens. The one on the right, I have violated the octet rule for phosphorus, but you'll notice in making this phosphorus oxygen double bond, I got rid of this charge and I got rid of this charge. So I'm carrying less charge, less atoms, fewer atoms are carrying charge in this polyatomic by breaking the octet rule, right? And so the lesson is whenever possible, right, we can violate the octet rule um, if it helps us to reduce charge. So when multiple Lewis dot diagrams are possible, right? The one where the fewest number of atoms are carrying charge, that is the best structure. So as we can see, right, in forming this oxygen-phosphorus double bond, we were able to remove the negative charge from this oxygen, remove the positive charge from that phosphor phosphorus. So we were able to remove these two charges, right, this making this a better structure, even though we did violate the octet rule for phosphorus. And that's fine because phosphorus can have more than eight electrons in its outer shell. So the important things from today, understand electronegativity, how that works, how the trends work in establishing a polar bond, be able to draw Lewis dot structures, apply the rules that we covered, understand resonance formulas, what those structures look like, and be able to determine uh, formal charges and understand uh, the violations that we covered with respect to the violations of our Lewis dot structures. Next class, we're going to get into molecular geometry and Vesper theory.